The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to a webinar that we're having today. My name is Paul Bemis and I will be your host for today's program. Today we're going to be talking about optimizing the performance of a multi-level high-performance computing data center. And this is some work that we did this year in cooperation with uh, two organizations. One of them is University of New Hampshire. Each year we sponsor students in their senior project in work related to data center modeling. And also Paul Richards is here again with me today from Wireless Sensors. Hello everyone. And, and what we're going to be talking about is a particular data center that we analyze. This one is a high performance data center and uh, therefore it has some interesting uh, qualities about it that, uh, that make it a little more interesting than normal. But just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, if you would like to ask questions throughout the presentation, I encourage you to type them into the chat window that is shown over on the, typically on the right-hand side of your display, and we'll pick them up at the end. Uh, the reason I do them that way as opposed to opening the microphones is audio quality is not always good. So uh, I think that it makes more sense to have you ask them, and then if we can open up the mic for you, we will do that towards the end. Uh, we generally plan these to be about 45 minutes with 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. We are recording it, and I will put it up as an archive on our website in the case that uh, some of your colleagues were not able to see it. I can provide you copies of slides if you want as well, but they will not contain all of the 3D data because that is a little more complicated and it gets into the gigabytes of data size. And then finally, uh, if you would like our certificate of participation and completion for one hour of continual training, please send me a note at the end and I'll, I'll produce one of those for you. Many of you who are uh, in the engineering profession uh, need a certain amount of hours of uh, continued education and this uh, does qualify for that. So with that, let me go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to try to make sure the audio is good by not manipulating data while I'm speaking. <laughs> uh, occasionally that happens where uh, if I start to manipulate 3D data, uh, the audio breaks down in this uh, go, to, go to webinar session. So let me go ahead and, and start the session here for us. And uh, the first thing I'll do is introduce my panel. Paul has already said hello. Paul, welcome to the show. He's president of Wireless Sensors. Thanks, Paul. Hi. Hello, everyone. I also have with me today uh, Jeffrey Kling. Jeffrey is a student uh, in the Mechanical Engineering Department. He's our representative here today. Hi, Jeff. Welcome to the show. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. Uh, we also have two other students who uh, today, as it turns out, is right in the middle of a uh, presentation of their project to uh, folks at UNH. So Connor and Jamie are both involved with, uh, with a booth of their own in the uh, Kingsbury uh, uh, Hall, I believe. Is that is that true, Jeff? Um, it's it's actually at the Whittemore this year, so oh. a bit more space. Yeah. All right. Well, what we're going to do today, we're going to take a look at this data center. It's a 15,000 square foot uh, data center, raised floor design with ceiling plenum return. This one is about 750 kW of heat load, 192 racks. And they're using rear door heat exchangers, the uh, cool centric uh, RDX units on 11 of the high density rows. This is a multi-level design. Um, the chillers, this is a water, uh, chilled water system. The chilling system, cooling system is in the basement, first floor. The second floor is data center. Uh, third floor is uh, inclusive of the return plenum. Not an unusual design. I've seen a variety of these used in high density situations where uh, the equipment is really housed in a separate floor altogether and then the cool air uh, moves up onto the uh, into the the plenum of essentially the second floor. Um, so this design took us a little while to figure out <laughs> from the drawings of course the drawings are all in 2D took us a, a little bit of staring at it to figure out how it all worked uh, but it is a, a very nice data center relatively new in terms of size, uh, in terms of uh, date. And our objectives for the project uh, with uh, Jeff and his team is to build a model of the existing situation. Uh, Paul's participation is to use uh, 
is wireless sensor temperature measurements to both validate the model and then to provide continuous monitoring of the environment once the uh, initial models are done. And we are going to be looking for optimization, of course. We're going to check first the airflow, make sure that it's balanced with the needs of the room. We're going to check the air supply temperature, and then we're going to drive it for optimization, which means uh, look at these parameters that you've become used to having us look at, because I always strive for the same parameters, and those are RTI and RCI, and I'll define those in a moment. And then we're going to play what-if games. What if we were to reduce the airflow? What if we were to increase the air supply? And that's the benefit of this kind of modeling. Uh, Computer-based modeling is used to study conditions that you don't want to or are unable to test on your own. And that's, uh, that's what we'll do. So first, let me uh, go over the metrics. For many of you, you know these already. I don't want to belabor this point, but I do feel it's necessary to review them for those who have not seen them. There are two that we look at. Our TI stands for return temperature index. And that, for us, is a ratio of air handler flow rate compared to rack flow rate. So you see right here in this relationship, we need the rack flow rate and the air handler flow rate to be balanced. They should be equivalent. If they're exactly balanced, then it's at 100%. If they're greater than 100%, it means that there's not enough air handler and you've got too much rack uh, flow and uh, this thing starts to go greater than 100%. If, you, if it's less than 100%, then the air handler is blowing too much air, whether it's a crack or an air handler or whatever it is, you've got too much airflow coming through the cooling system to meet the demands of the racks and it just simply recirculates and goes back to the air handler. So it's called... Uh, uh, bypass airflow. So you try to drive these to be equal to one another. And the reason for that is you want the air handler delta T to be as high as you can get it. That's where you get uh, mechanical efficiency. That's where you get good performance out of a heat exchanger. And of course, that's going to give you a lower energy consumption. The other one we use is our CI. This is rack cooling index. And there's a both high and low on this one. Here, what we're looking for is, are the racks in compliance as compared to the ASHRAE thermal guidelines? It's a measure of compliance. Uh, if it's 100%, it means that all rack inlets are within temperature on high side and within temperature on low side. And I know many people say, well, why do we care about low side? If, you know, if they're too cold, it's okay. Yes, but if they're too cold, then you're wasting a bunch of energy mechanically because you're having to create that cold air. Uh, so you want them to be in the middle. In the middle is defined by ASHRAE. This is an allowable standard. This has, by the way, become somewhat of a relaxed the representation. They can actually range a lot more than this on the high side. But recommended is 64 to 80 uh, Fahrenheit. And allowable is 59 to, to roughly 90 Fahrenheit. Now, I generally work in this range, recommended, that's a conservative place to work. I try to drive my designs to be comfortable here because, again, this is, we're modeling here and we're having to make some assumptions and so you want to uh, be a little bit conservative. Okay, so those are the two metrics we're going to be using. And uh, here's the data center. Now, Jeff, it was you and, uh, and, and, and Connor and Jamie who laid this out. Um, this is a multi-level design. Give me your perspective on uh, how it was to lay this thing out, how much time it took you, and, and what you felt, what you, what you learned from that. All right. Um, well, going into this, I had uh, no experience with CoolSim, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of a guy who likes to bang my head against something and then kind of learn that way. But I was ple pleasantly surprised with CoolSim. Um, the UI is very simple and straightforward. Um, I remember I, I, um, we, we knocked this out in one night. Um, we kind of just sat down and. I took one half, and um, Jamie and Connor took the other the other half. They took the water cooled side, which is on the, the right of the image shown. Mm -hmm. um, and really, the hardest thing actually was figuring out how to pan through the data center. I remember for the longest time I was zooming all the way out because I had no clue how to pan over to one side or the other. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I the um, the UI is very clean. You can open up in a the racks and you can uh, you, you can 
reach the level of precision that you need. Um, when you drop things into CoolSim, you can kind of eyeball it, um, eyeball the placement of the racks, which is, which is what we did at first. Mm -hmm. And then um, as we need more precision, you can open up um, the windows for every element and really get as precise as you want. Um, so it, it was a lot easier, I think, to learn um, from a you know an entry level perspective. It was a lot easier than something like Simulink or, or Map. MathCAD or SolidWorks even, where I had to spend a lot of time yes. learning. Now in this design, this one was a little different in that um, one of the things I've noticed here about this is we have uh, rear door heat exchangers, so we had to put those in place. Those are seen here in blue. Um, but also we're using crack units here along the side because the way this worked is that it pulled air from that third floor of that large plenum down the walls effectively and uh, and then the supply was delivered through the floor uh, so the way we represented that is to really just with inlets and outlets the the outlets here are at the at the top they come in through the ceiling plenum and the supplies are down below so uh, here's another shot of the underfloor and you see here these are the supply uh, ducts coming into the subfloor. They come in from the side. I believe there's 12 of them. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Now, we didn't really know what the balance on these were, right, Jeff? I mean, we assumed that based on the air handler flow volume, we just divided by 12, right? Right. That, that was one of the problems we faced. And it's kind of an idealized model because I think in, in reality, they only have three working AHUs, whereas we put 12 so that we have a uh, relatively consistent flow throughout the room. In fact, we have absolutely even flow throughout the room. And, yes. And from what I understand, talking to uh, some of the design people working on this uh, particular facility, it's not even. And uh, this, this uh, becomes a challenge in systems where there's a lot of duct work that runs, like from, in this case, first floor from the air handlers up to the second floor. There are losses in the ducting system. There's uneven distribution in the ducting system depending upon how the, the system is laid out. It's best to have a big manifold and everything come off the manifold. You have to worry about equal lengths of piping. Not an easy thing to do to get the system balanced the way it's supposed to be balanced. Um, and, and we didn't have time. Uh, by the way, this data center is in New Jersey, and, and <laughs> we're all in New Hampshire. So we didn't really have the luxury. And Jeff's got classes every day. so. Uh, you know, we don't have we didn't have the luxury to go down and, and take a bolometer and climb into the subfloor and measure uh, what was coming out of it. So again, with modeling, what you try to do uh, is you try to get as close as you can to to reality, and then use it as a guide to to perform sound judgment. You know, <laughs> a lot of people think that CFD is a forensic tool. It's not. It's a tool used to improve your decision-making process, <laughs> not uh, not be a, a forensic tool. Uh, so we have to make some assumptions. So here was the methodology. And, and I was the uh, advisor for the UNH team. And this was the methodology that I gave them or encouraged them to pursue. First, build a model of the data center as best you can. Avoid all the little tiny stuff that won't won't necessarily affect airflow because it is not a CAD system. Uh, we build meshes in these environments and these volumes, and so the mesh is going to be very sensitive to how you've positioned things and and, uh, and will grow large if you put a lot of small stuff in it because it thinks you're interested in that small stuff. Sometimes you are because it's important, but uh, most times it's the big parameters, the dominant parameters that make up the uh, overall dynamics physics of the room. Things like position of inlets and outlets, things like the size of the room, the size of the plenum, the ceiling return, tile placement, percent area open on tiles. Um, and I also encourage them to work with average watts per rack. You can get into more detail than that. You can go inside the rack and cool sim and set the load specifically uh, all the way down to a single U of detail. But it's hard to know what the load is at that level. Um, and in this case, what we had was PDU data that was given to us by the data center operators in this case, who were able to tell us what each rack was pulling. And so we used average watts per rack uh, for this particular analysis. 
you can get an awful lot of good information using that level of granularity. And again, you can increase your level of granularity, your level of fidelity over time. Uh, once the model's built and you've used average watts per rack, you can always go in and tighten it up and tighten down the, uh, improve the, the granularity by adding the density per unit area in the rack. Uh, but it can be done in steps. And then we used measured data to both set the boundary conditions of the, of the, of the equipment. We set the supply air temperature using measured data that was provided to us by the facility operators. We used measured watts per rack. We assumed a 20 degree delta across racks, which is again an assumption, can be changed, but that is what we assumed. It's a conservative uh, uh, assumption. And we assumed 156 cubic feet per minute per kilowatt for rack cooling, which is uh, really what is necessary to satisfy the convective heat transfer equation at uh, at atmospheric conditions. So those were the conditions. These are all assumptions that can be changed, of course, but that's the assumptions we used going in there. And then we used measured data to validate it, and that's where Paul Richards' uh, company, Wireless Sensors, came in. He provided us the instrumentation and supported us in the project to validate the model. We started off by comparing first the air supply temperature and return temperature to to what we measured, or what we predicted. Generally, I look for it to be within 20%. If I can get it below 20, I feel really good at 10. Um, and then we do the same thing for the racks. We first get the, the uh, air handlers set, because the air handlers return supply temperature will tell us whether or not we've predicted the load in the room correctly. Uh, and then we go for the racks themselves, see if we got the load distributed correctly in the room. And then we adjust the parameters until they match measured values within an acceptable level, and then we've got a validated model. The governing equation for all of this is the convective heat transfer equation, which is simply heat transfer is equal to flow rate times density times specific heat of air times the difference between the two temperatures, uh, either on a rack front and back or on an on a air handler uh, return supply. So you see here that if the delta T doesn't match across the cracks, the only issue can be either flow rate uh, or load. So here's the load, here's the flow rate. Density isn't going to change. Specific heat isn't going to change, at least not much. It does change the temperature a bit, but not much. So really, you know, it's a question of did we get the load right in the room? So this example was built from drawings. They provided us a series of drawings that we stared at for quite some time to figure out what was going on. <laughs> 2D drawings on PDF format <laughs> on a design like this are sometimes hard to understand. We then used the air supply uh, temperature for measurements given to us, rack positions from drawings provided to us, and loads were taken from PDUs, measurements taken at the, uh, at the site. So now here's an initial set of results, and again, sometimes my audio will break up a little bit here, but uh, what I'm showing you is, uh, yeah, if my audio breaks up a bit, guys, let me know, because it's beginning to warn me that I, <laughs> but what I have here is uh, the uh, results coming out of CoolSim for the initial base run. Um, so let me zoom in a little bit here and show you this more. Now, the nice thing about CoolSim results, can be exported from, yeah, it's because I was rotating, yeah. So I'll stop rotating for a moment and my audio should clear up. But uh, the nice thing about CoolSim is you can take a look at the data outside of the application uh, in a PowerPoint presentation such as this one. This is a simple PowerPoint presentation, but I'm, I'm able to take the entire set of data out of the program and display it. And the first uh, piece I want to show you is the summary report. You see here in these hyperlinks are all kinds of data. We have temperature clouds, uh, cut planes, uh, compliance to rack inlet conditions. But the one I want to first uh, review is the summary report. In the summary report, there are, this is a text-based report that gives you information about the data center. And we have uh, description, uh, energy report, performance report. The one I want to draw your attention to right away is the energy report. 
The energy report is where we talk about and calculate the RTI and RCI. And you see here right away, we've got an RTI of 63.3%, which if you remember, the RTI is the ratio of the rack requirement versus the air handler requirement. So this means that given uh, the loading that's in that room of about 750 kW, we've got way too much airflow, about 40% too much airflow. And the problem you have when you have too much airflow is that your return temperatures get cooled down, your heat exchanger doesn't work as well as it, it should, and of course you have to spend a lot more energy creating cold air than you would otherwise. So right away we know we've got trouble in the room. Now the RCI is 100%, the high, which means there's no racks exhibiting uh, any hot spots. The place is certainly cool enough right now, uh, but the low is 78%, which means I've got upwards of 30, 28 to 30, 22% at least of my racks are exhibiting temperatures that are too cold. So let's, uh, let's just take a look. Now again, this is my initial model. We haven't calibrated it yet. But if I look at my rack inlets here, and I look at my recommended range for rack inlets, and this plot is kind of a conformance plot here. What this allows me to do, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can see it. What we've done here is we've taken the ASHRAE recommended temperature range, and we've made it green. If you're red, it means you're above it. If you're blue, it means you're below it. It's a conformance plot. And what you can see here is that we've got an awful lot of blue in that room, that we're seeing an awful lot of cold temperature in that room, which means two things. One, I've got probably too much airflow. We know that. And number two, I'm running too cold. So I've got both too much airflow and too cold a temperature, both are recipes for high energy consumption. So. The other thing I wanted to uh, point out here is there are some hot spots in that room. If we look at one of the slices of, uh, of the data, you can see that there's quite a bit of air being built up right here. And let me just uh, go back and see if I can show you that first in 3D. So this will take, again, just a second to load. And uh, I'm going to take a look at this one, Z equal 30. Uh, that's the one I was uh, looking at on the second page. This is a 3D model. I'm going to zoom in on it. And you will notice, one of the things you'll notice about this data center in its current form is there aren't a lot of ceiling tiles in the design at all. So let me just uh, zoom this around and, and take a look in at it. So I'm zooming in on sections of this room. And this is over in the, the high density area of the room. And you can see there's quite a bit of heat right here. And this is something we felt in that room, didn't we? Uh, when we were there, Paul, we felt you could put your hand up over here and feel this rather high temperature. Yeah, in fact, yeah. it, was, it was quite noticeable and it was certainly measurable. Yes. Yeah. The other thing here that's kind of interesting is that you see that it's rather hot here and cool in the plenum. The ceiling plenum is cooler than what's in the room, which suggests that, uh, you know, the, the ceiling grills could be added there to let some of that heat out. And, uh, and I understand that uh, the ceiling grills, when we were there, were taken out to try to start to get the room into some state of balance and that they would be added later. But again, this is a snapshot in time, and, and there's a, a 2D shot of it. So the first thing we did, of course, check the air handlers to make sure that they matched. And what we have here is the measured return. This data was provided to us by the uh, facility team. Uh, that manages the data center. And here's what we were predicting on average for our return. And you can see that, that it's not too bad. It's certainly below 20%. It's 11 in terms of uh, average uh, deltas. And uh, we didn't take measurements. Uh, you know, I, you work with what you have. And we didn't get under the floor and measure each one of these returns. So we don't know exactly how the temperature is distributed uh, throughout the room. All we had was one number coming back to the air handler. Um, and again, you have to use judgment with respect to how you use these uh, numbers and use the model. Um, all we had was one number for return temperature. We don't even know the distance between the 
the, uh, the room and the air handler itself where that temperature was made. We didn't even know where the sensor is <laughs> for, that, for that 81 degree temperature. Uh, but you work with what you have and from a total heat in the room, heat rejection, heat removal point of view, um, our totals are, are pretty good and our delta was pretty good. So that looked good. But when we started to look at the racks, uh, we saw some discrepancy. Now, these racks are the ones that, uh, that Paul and I were down there. He, the two of us went down to make the measurements. Our students were pretty busy, and we did this over one of the breaks. So we went down and made these measurements. Um, and um, Paul, uh, one of the things that we noticed here, if you, if you look at our data, is that the uh, particularly for some of these high-density devices, there's a, there's a positive delta T here, like this one, 6.3 kW, and it's rising 7 degrees. Now, this measurement is made on the other side of that heat exchanger, so it's supposed to be net zero, but it certainly wasn't, was it? No, it, it, it absolutely wasn't, and again, one could observe that uh, physically, and then by measurement, uh, certainly we validated that. And uh, so, you know, immediately you run into the situation of the design uh, does not match the actual. Right. And of course that's, that's, that's what real-time sensing uh, draws that out immediately, and especially when coupled with a tool like Paul has that allows you to take that real-time information and then model and predict becomes a powerful combination um, and more powerful perhaps than each individual item. Right. And the use of temperature as a measurement to validate the CFD models, I think, is a very nice way to go as opposed to, I know a lot of people have used bolometers and used airflow in the past, but temperature is a little easier to measure and uh, you can get more data points and it's essentially what we're looking for anyway at the end of the day is temperature. And Paul, now, if, I can, if, if I can interject a, a little something more at this point too, uh, earlier on Paul made the mention of using average uh, load per rack, so many kilowatts per rack. And the notion of using temperature measurement to calibrate the, the model uh, really allows that sort of um, uh, initial parameter setting to be looser like that because the temperature settings, uh, the temperature measurements come back and, and allow you to tune that in without having to look at each individual component because the the load is going to be representative by the delta T across that rack. That's right. Um, That's right. So and, and it can be nothing but that. So uh, what it says is is especially with an with a easy to use and implement tool like Paul has, these things do not need to be complicated to implement. Right. As long as the process uh, is used. Now, tell me a little bit about the methodology for measuring temperature here for each of these racks, Paul. So what we did in this case, we started with the information that Paul's model originally, uh, initially provided us uh, with the predicted delta T's based on the assumptions that he had made, and then we representatively deployed sensors, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about what those are uh, here in a moment but deployed sensors for the supply and return or the, or the hot aisle and the cold aisle side of the racks and observe those measurements to obtain a delta T. Um, now these devices are wireless, so they can be deployed very quickly. They can be redeployed, moved about. And we took a handful, handful, let's say, um, I think in this case there were maybe 10 uh, individual sensor points that we strategically located uh, to validate the model. And for each rack, three on the front, three on the back, right? That's good. Well, we use three on the, three on the front and one on the back in this yeah. instance. Yeah. Now, this brings up a point about measurement again versus uh, simulation. What we do in CFD is we create a mesh, and therefore on the back or front of any rack, there could be hundreds of cells. There are hundreds of cells and we predict or calculate an average temperature for each of those and then average those averages. So the number of data points going into the CFD calculation is much higher 
and will pick up a very subtle changes in, in a distribution of temperature across that rack where when you go ahead and measure you've got a limited amount of time and money so you can't sample a hundred spots. Having said that, even though at the bottom here our overall era wasn't too bad, we felt that uh, some of them were off. Um, for example, we were assuming that there was some temperature drop uh, across that rack that, that, the, that we actually lost temperature from the front of the rack to the rear of the rear door heat exchanger when in fact it was actually going the other way. So we felt that there were a couple of these that uh, we needed to go in and, and tune and we had uh, Jeff and his team go back and and change some of the assumptions associated with the heat rejection uh, by the rear door heat exchanger. So if you, Paul, want to go ahead and, and uh, just review this, this slide as well, this is one of yours. Sure, sure. So um, a product like CoolSim and a product like our wireless sensor products, uh, sensor systems, uh, we're really addressing the same problem, same issue, coming at it from a slightly different direction, but Paul and I tend to sing from the same hymnal, and that is understanding what your baseline is allows you to make intelligent decisions. And, and we have an acronym that we use for this, which we call our simple approach. And uh, uh, it starts with the notion that if you don't measure uh, and sample, you can't control things. And you know, before going too much further, just for a point of, of full disclosure, to simply calibrate Paul's cool sim model, you actually don't need continuous measurement. You could take spot measurements, snapshot in time, and use those to compare against the cool sim and, uh, and go back and do a calibration. But of course, at that point, then your, your sampling stops. You've, you've done a sample. And so it doesn't support the what if, uh, what if concepts that a tool like CoolSim is so powerful in implementing. So, uh, so, we, so sample uh, imperative in trying to optimize and then maintain the optimization. And Paul will go on a little bit further here, but we also uh, have a mantra of reach for the low hanging fruit. You know, fix the things that you can fix first that temperatures, uh, temperature gradients, temperature deltas will tell you, such as blanking panels, uh, turf tiles, return, uh, things of that nature. Try to maximize the system that you have. And a, a primary way of maximizing, and Paul has spoken to it, is stop overcooling. If you are uh, providing more BTUs of cooling than what the equipment requires, well, you are simply wasting energy either in delivering it through the fans or in inefficiencies in your heat exchangers on the back end. So uh, simply turning up the thermostat can maximize your operation. And then once you've done that, uh, th this is an interesting note because this was a, a relatively new, sophisticated and well-engineered data center with sophisticated users, sophisticated engineers who had put it together. It was what two years old, Paul? Is that or was it under two years old? Well, it was new, and I don't think it's certainly more than two. Furthermore, furthermore, it has airside economizer built into it, so it's a it's a a, a chilled water based system with an airside economizer. Um, very, very nice job, by the way, in terms of a, a, an initial design. Uh, but what, what we found, it was just sub optimized, you know. So the, the point I would make here, this notion of protecting your efficiency gains, is here was a case where a, a modern data center, new design, and it was not operating as designed. Right out of the box, it was not operating as designed. And they, the owner did not have sufficient monitoring in place to be able to quantify what that suboptimal operation was. So the combination of sensing and a tool like CoolSim allowed us to very quickly determine what that was locate some hidden capacity uh, based on this information and ensure that as your and, and this ensure part, the reason it was not operating as designed is the minute they designed the thing, they changed the deployment schema based on some third party influences into the system. So they had a beautiful design, it wasn't what they built. Yep. And so this happened to be from the moment they commissioned it, but 
they are also and have made changes subsequently. So uh, the types of products that, that we deployed to solve some of these troubles uh, look like this. It's uh, wireless sensor devices that can be very easily deployed, uh, gateway devices that, that don't require additional software and can make these environmental measurements so that um, um, you can get your arms around it and use the information to feed into something like CoolSense. Mm -hmm. Okay, back to you, Paul. Yeah, so uh, this is a, a just a plot here of uh, the after the students reset the rear door heat exchangers, you see here the the uh, the numbers are a little better, and you'll see right here where we were having trouble before at 6.3, we're down, we were 28% variance there, now we're at 12%. Um, so we're still a little cold overall, um, but uh, we don't, could dial that in a little better by changing the supply air temperature most likely, uh, but uh, or the loads would be a little bit off possibly. But not too bad now. We're we're showing on this one. In fact, it's about the same. We're seeing about the same delta T's all the way across. And so, uh, all we had to do was adjust for some of the inefficiency of the uh, rear door heat exchanger. Now, in, in defense of that device, by the way, that's also a control system, uh, and getting it set correctly takes a little bit of iteration as well. So these things will behave differently depending upon their application. I find that they work better under heavy load than they do under light load. And also the control system that feeds water through these rear door heat exchangers needs to be taken into account as well. In fact, in your data center, there are multiple control systems going on, and, and sometimes they fight against one another. You've got, in this case, variable speed fan, economizer side, air economizer uh, base cooling system. You've got rear door heat exchangers with their own control system and flow rate proportionate to a sensor going through the back door. And you've got the computers themselves, who, by the way, have fans that go up and down uh, at least at two stages based on inlet temperature. So multiple control systems, data centers, guess what, are getting a little more complicated. So here is a set of results here um, that uh, come uh, from uh, calibration. After calibration, we can take a look at this data. And we go back and we take a look at our uh, energy report again, and it's still right where it was, 63%. I've still got way too much airflow, but at least now my model is calibrated, and I know exactly what uh, I'm looking at is, in fact, representative of the situation. The plots on recommended temperature are going to essentially the same. Again, here what I've got is uh, uh, too much airflow, and it's uh, too cold. There are a bunch of other plots here that we could look at, including animations, but I'm afraid if I play one, um, it's going to uh, screw up the audio. <laughs> so now here's what we do. What if we start to make some changes? What if we reduce airflow, and then once we get the RTI where we need it, let's start working on RCI. Um, what does it do? And uh, do we need air management? How far could we go before we ran into trouble? So the first thing that uh, that we did uh, is to increase the uh, decrease the airflow to reduce bypass airflow. And you know how much do you do it? Well, I generally go at like 20 or 30 percent and see what happens. Great thing about a computer model, you don't have to worry about uh, having uh, people call you up and complain because their computers are too hot. Uh, you can do it all on, the com on, on a simulator and uh, see what happens. So the first thing that uh, we did as a team is take the airflow down 30%. And this set of results here um, is just that. It's the same data center where the airflow has been reduced by 30%. Now let's go right back to that summary report and let's take a look at the energy report. And you see here that the RTI came up. The 75 percent. That's not too bad. Now you can try to get that to 100 percent, but in a data center that is convective return for the most part, you may have to do some work with airflow management. So uh, we went for 30. Could probably go higher, but we reduced it by 30 uh, right away. 
And let's take a look at those inlet temperatures again. Now you see here, it's better. We, we are in better shape than we were before. Uh, the, uh, there's not as much blue as there was in the room. If we go back and take a look at our summer report and look at the energy, we see that the RCI low came up to 83%. So that's looking better, and that's what we're seeing in this plot right here, is that there's less blue than there was before. These are rack inlets uh, colored by temperature. And you see we're in fairly good shape now, except we're too cold. So the, the next step, therefore, is to uh, take a look at what can be done to increase supply air temp. So this is just a still shot of the scene I just showed you. But by reducing the air handler flow rate 30%, the energy on the fans comes way down. Remember, your fan is uh, uh, conforms to a fan law, which means that the power to drive it is uh, a relationship to the RPM that is cubic. So uh, I didn't use a cubic relationship here because that's an ideal law, but uh, fan energy comes down quickly as you reduce uh, the amount of airflow. I estimated it to be about 43%, and the racks are still, still in conformance. So then the next question becomes, okay, I got my RTI in pretty good shape. What about RCI? Um, and the rule of thumb here, which is really just a rule of thumb, you have to do some pretty uh, long math to, to figure exactly what happens here. But for, uh, and this is a set of ASHRAE guidelines here, uh, for about every 1.8 degree F, you get about 3.5% increase in mechanical efficiency. And that's because you don't have as much lift. Lift is the delta P, the pressure difference required in order to uh, reject more heat from the compressor so that you can have a lower temperature uh, coming out of it during the expansion phase of the cycle. Um, so that's a fair representation for many, uh, particularly chilled water devices, and it doesn't take into account the improved window or the wider, the increasing window caused by the air side economizer. And I did some calculations here using an online tool for the team that looks like about 500 hours would be opened up. Uh, again, I mentioned this, this data centers in New Jersey. You could get about another 500 hours per year of pure airside uh, operation with no mechanical compressor if you increase the air supply temp uh, 10 degrees F. So that's not a trivial amount. That's uh, quite a bit and uh, certainly worth uh, taken a look at. So what happens, I guess, and this is a uh, run me to show are those conditions. Now here again we've got uh, airflow down 30 percent and temperature up 10 degrees. Let's go right back to our energy report and take a look. As we saw RTI 75 percent, RCI high 90 now. See we've come down off 100 a little bit, which means I've got a few spots out of spec compared to the ASHRAE recommended. And again, my low is still 100. I'm still not uh, too cold. I'm not too cold anywhere. Remember, this was in the 70s before. I'm now at 100. Let's take a look at those rack inlets and see how look. And you see here, I've got a few of those racks now exhibiting problems. Now, this shouldn't surprise us. This is the, this is the area of high density, for one thing. This is the high density area of the room. And furthermore, uh, we don't have any ceiling grills in this area of the room at the moment, certainly not many. And I can see that cloud forming over there, right? Paul, when we visited the site, we could feel that cloud over there. Yes, ab absolutely. And, and this, this is where uh, having real-time monitoring does create a tremendous value in the sense that you can map the sensors to what the model is telling you. and then have a comfort level that if in fact you implement this, that you have sensory, low, uh, sensory points there that are going to keep your equipment safe. And as you make some of the changes that the model would suggest you should make, you can validate that that is in fact what's going on uh, in real time. And wireless allows you to redeploy and deploy sensors very quickly and easily uh, as the model suggests they should be deployed. 
And, and over here, one of the things I wanted to point out in this part of the room is what we call a classroom style. So classroom style of rack alignment is with the fronts facing all to the front, like students in a classroom. And uh, you see here that's what's happening is you've got the hot air coming out of the back of this rack and contaminating and mixing with the cold air coming out of those perforated tiles and being fed into the intake over here. Um, from discussion with the with the managers of this data center, there's the thought of putting another hot aisle right, another row right here that would face this one um, or face that one so there would be another cold aisle right here, but it's not, it hasn't been deployed at the moment. And so this is, this is exactly what we have. Now again, if we take a look at a Z slice of this, the Z is a, is a vertical slice. This is the same one we were looking at before. And let me just bring this around so you can see it clearly. Um, and again, I'm just looking at results here. You see that cloud still over there, and it's it's a little hotter now than it was <laughs> because we've turned up the heat. This uh, slice right in here is the heat between the rear door of the of the uh, cabinet and the heat exchanger on the back side. This is the region outside that, and you see that cloud forming right up there. Again, cooler up in the ceiling plenum than it is in the room. Kind of an interesting uh, phenomena there. So we're running at 91%. The question then becomes, OK, what can be done to mitigate that situation over there? And uh, this is where um, the team did some changes here based on discussion. Uh, one of the things is separate that section. Use a baffle right here. Um, the baffle is just a drag and drop. So it's basically a wall, zero thickness wall. You set the percent area open to zero so that it doesn't leak. It becomes a barrier. And put some perf tiles in place. I'm, I'm sorry, some ceiling tiles. You see the, this is the first model here that we've built that we're starting to add ceiling grills. And you may say, well, why didn't you have them before? Well, these cabinets over here are all chimney cabinets. They're already ducted directly to the ceiling. Uh, but over here, we didn't have any because it was assumed these rear door heat exchangers were going to absorb all the heat in this section and we wouldn't need them. Or the designers didn't think they'd need them. But what we found is that these rear door heat exchangers were not 100% efficient. They were creating a net delta T between the intake and the exhaust for one reason or another. And so there's a lot of heat building up in this section of the room. The other thing I'd like to point out is these red things are PDUs. These are um, power distribution units. And they generate a little heat. Uh, not a tremendous amount because they're fairly efficient. But they do provide some residual heat to the room. And there was no, no place for it to get out. Um, I guess the final point here is just rearranging some floor tiles to let a few of those uh, cabinets breathe a little better. So that's. Uh, and so here we are. This is sort of the, the final representation. Uh, and again, let's go take a look at, at our energy uh, calculation here, summer report. Take a look at energy. And you see the RTI is 75%. But look, our CI went to 99. And our low is at 100. This means I have very few 1% less than 1% of my racks have any problems in terms of compliance with the recommended standard that the RCI low is at 100. I'm not too cold anymore. I'm right in the middle, right in that Goldilocks range. And the RTI 75, I'd love to see that a little higher, but uh, probably you'd drive, you'd, you'd have some issues getting there. So now let's take a look at our recommended rack inlet temperatures. Here they are. Everybody's green. Everybody's happy. Got a little bit of red over here in this corner still. But it's way up high. Uh, generally, that's not a problem because you don't generally put servers way up high. You'll notice that if we switch to allowable, it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's even uh, in full compliance. And this is a uh, 90 degree upper temperature. And let's take a look at our, our slice that we were looking at before. And again, I'll, I'll bring this around so that we can 
I'll come in on it. I mean, we've still got some temperature buildup over there. So uh, can probably optimize that a little bit more. Uh, still a cloud over there, huh, Paul? Absolutely, yeah. So we increased the RCI high to just about 99%, which is uh, what you want. And so just a quick summary, built the model, validated it, used the model to predict the effects of changes we were planning to make or wanted to make. Step one, adjust the RTI. Um, then step two, increase the air supply temp. And then if you have air management problems, work on them in the model or as a way to understand how to improve it. So by changing the airflow, uh, we got about 43%. It was the estimate on uh, the air handler, the horsepower required to drive the fans. Increasing supplier temp 20%. About 20% for 10 degrees, it's a fair, it's a fair uh, sort of rule of thumb to consider. We add another 500 hours to the free air component, which is going to save a lot of money because you don't have to do, use compressor. And we projected that operating under that mode at 10 cents an hour would yield 400k a year in savings. Um, quite significant. And this is pretty close fairly close to, according to the people operating the data center, we were pretty close to, uh, to, to predicting their total energy consumption at this point. So fairly good uh, representation, I think, of, uh, of what we had there. Um, Jeff, any comments you have here or, or thoughts at the end? Um, no, not, not really anything. Um, just I wanted to clarify maybe a point about um, the assumptions that we made with the um, rear door heat exchangers. Um, you had mentioned, I, I believe you had mentioned that we had originally assumed a 20 degree delta across the, the crack units. Um, and kind of when we were um, looking at kind of how to calibrate our model, um, one of the things, this, the general equation that you showed, um, the Q equals flow rate times uh, CP times delta T, um, there's really there's two things that we we looked at when we were trying to calibrate, and that was um, either flow rate or the the assumed delta T across the crack units. Right. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that um, we we decided to lower the delta T because as you showed uh, a few slides ago, that our our predicted results were running much cooler than the measured results, which is probably a function of us over predicting the um, efficiency of the of the crack units. Right. Right. The rear, rear door heat exchangers can be modeled uh, a couple different ways. They all can be. And we used delta T on this one. Um, so the decision you have to make is, do I change the flow rate or do I change the assumed delta T? And that's, in this case, we, uh, we changed the delta T because it wasn't dropping the full 20 degrees as we thought it was. Okay. So we have about 10 minutes now for questions and answers. And uh, I'd encourage you, if you have any questions, to type them into the, the, uh, the chat window over there on the right of your uh, GoToWebinar session. Um, there's a couple here that I'll, I'll pick up and hand to the panel. Uh, first one's easy. Uh, is it being recorded? Yes. We are recording this today, and I will make this available as an archive on our website. There's a whole set of these uh, presentations that have been done in the past that are there, and I'll add this one to the top so that you can find it easy. Uh, the second one is, can we get a file or presentation that shows the RTI, RCI ranges? Yes, you certainly can. There is a white paper already on our website that, that deals with that and talks about RCI and RTI, but uh, I certainly can make this available to any of you as a hard copy, a PDF as well, if you want. I do have our email addresses up here uh, on the display. If any of you would like to contact uh, Jeff, myself, or Paul, uh, you have our email addresses here. Send us a note. We try to make these uh, educational and informative, so you know, feel free to, to ask us anything that you you might uh, might want to ask. Um, so here's a question: uh, Can you touch briefly on any work in the design library that was required on the on the Cray, the Craw, the, the air handler and rear door heat exchangers? 
I'm not sure if they're in the default library, so you had to build them. Uh, in this case, we did build them. Uh, we simply took the, uh, Jeff, I think you did that work. You simply took the, the, uh, the standard uh, in-row and standard uh, uh, downflow and modified them, I believe, correct? Um, yes, I believe Connor did that, but that, that is what he did. Now, there is a CoolSim release coming out here. Uh, 4.3 is uh, just about wrapping up now. And in 4.3, we will be adding the, uh, the rear door heat exchanger um, so that you can drag that from the library and drop it into place. So that one will be added. Another one, how do you calculate the heat removed rate? Um, the uh, heat removed is actually calculated in CFD. We do it through um, the conservation of energy, uh, mass, and momentum equations. We break the room up into a volume of cells. Each cell is a polygon, and it is either a hexagon or a, could be a prism or a tetrahedra, depending upon the shape of the surface it's trying to adhere to or conform to. We then calculate conservation of mass, energy, and momentum uh, on all the faces and interpolate them across the center. So we're able to calculate heat removal by looking at delta T across the room and flow rate, the rate of the, the fluid movement across the room. So that's what CFD does. It, it's actually a very good heat transfer calculation device. It's a 3D heat transfer as opposed to just uh, assuming it's only one-dimensional. When, when you're in school, they teach you a one-dimensional approach in heat transfer. This is three dimensions. It's looking at all directions at once. Now the follow-on question seems to be, What's the purpose of predicting when you have the real-time actual information? And the reason that we predict is so that we can look at a, a situation that we can't measure or haven't yet measured. Um, that's what the predictive component of CFD is valuable for. It allows you to predict with good confidence a future state. So if you build a model and you validate it against the current state, today's situation, you can then perturb the model into a future state, either one you want to have or one you may encounter, <laughs> not, not because you want to, but because of a failure, and understand what would happen in that state. So Paul and I have been working quite a bit together here because these two technologies are very, very complementary. It is the, the measurement for, for the today situation, the simulator to predict the future situation, and then, of course, once you get to that future situation, the continuous monitoring to make sure you stay <laughs> in that optimized state. Right, Paul? Yeah, and just, just a quick extension using the example that you've just, uh, just described here is, so you went through uh, scaling back the airflow and raising the inlet temperatures and realized through the model that there would, that would create a hot spot at certain locations in the data center, which Real-time measurements wouldn't tell you that predicted state, so uh, and, and you you were able to recognize a 40% energy savings as a result of that prediction. So that is where the power of the two technologies blend together to allow that prediction to take place and then confidence to drive towards that predicted value because you know that you have sensory uh, information in place that is going to protect the equipment. Right. Okay, I think that's about it. Unless anyone else has any questions, I, I think we've covered most of the ones that were here uh, today. I want to uh, thank my panel for being here, Paul and Jeff, and uh, we will try to do another one of these in a, another couple of months. I try to do one at least every, every uh, two to three months if I can. If you have topics that you'd like to have covered, please drop me a line. If you have a data center that you would like us to take a look at, uh, I'm always looking for interesting data centers to analyze and to look at. Um, send me a note. We'll take a look. It doesn't have to reveal your company or it doesn't, you know, you don't have to worry about um, advertising here. It's, it's not an issue so much for us of uh, trying to get uh, any advertising done. It's more of a methodology. How do you go about it? How do you use tools like this to optimize data centers? And we try to make it more educational than, than anything else. So. 
Uh, if you have a data center you'd like to have us look at it, drop me a line. We'll, uh, we'll see what we can do in a future session. With that, I'd like to thank my panel, Jeff and Paul, and uh, wish everybody here a, a very good day. Yeah, Goodbye, thank you for having me, Paul. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone.